uh, you talk about civic spaces and the use of civic spaces. I, I thought your comments were striking about Union Station and so on. Do you know Dennis Lee's Civil Elegies, 1972, a long Canadian poem, the one that the, he won the GG that year, in which he talks about civic spaces and their impact and uses on uh, and effects on identity, mm -hmm. which I thought were just uh, uh, striking. And my question is, who, uh, who is the filmmaker? I didn't talk very much about her. Who, who is she? She's amazing. Um, her name's Terrell Calder. She's from Fort Francis, Manitoba. Ah. So she's a Métis filmmaker, and she lives in Toronto. Um, what can I say about her? I mean, I know what she thinks about her work. I know she's a very generous person, you know, to interview. If anybody's interested in taking up her work more, I know she's very interested in having conversations about her work. Um, what can I say? I mean, she's from, I think that she, um, she was part of a school, like an art school, a school of art in Winnipeg. Like she, you know, went to school and then she was part of, um, I can't remember what they're called, like the Something Lodge. They're really famous. And unfortunately I can't remember what they're called, but it's um, this group of artists in Winnipeg. That's sort of where she started out. And I can get that information for you if you're interested. Red Road Lodge, okay? And, um, She's also com been commissioned to make a new series of films that I, I really wanted to show one of them, but there hasn't been time, um, by a organization in Amsterdam, like a film organization, on the Seven Sacred Teachings. And so she's just made one on humility, and it is so stunning. And what she is doing is, um, she has this marionette puppet, and it's lying on this rotating uh, metal, um, circle and she's pulling sparkly confetti out of her like solar plexus and and while this is going on there's this sort of industrial noise and there's this narrative that combines like um, like um, the idea of bison hides the skin of fishes gutting fishes traditional practices and very contemporary um, sort of agonized treatments of femininity and identity and, and like very, um, I would say urban or even urbane. And so there's this, she's, I really kind of want to talk about this work too, that's why I'm spending so much time on it. Um, but that's who she is, you know, and uh, all of her works are stunning, I think. I'm really excited to be writing a dissertation chapter on her work. Sean respond to yeah. uh, Lynn's question because I, I know you have some important things to say there. No doubt. Um, the, uh I mean, first of all, actually, I thank you for pointing that out because I, I think that I did not do it justice in terms of, um, you know, transposing that onto a linear framework. And um, I mean, that said, within uh, Anishinaabe civilization, there, there, it's not exclusively non-linear either. Um, there is a distinction between the Atsukan, like the sacred stories, and the Bajimoin, um, the uh, uh, other stories that are still very important, but can be traced onto a linear framework that are, um, yeah, but don't necessarily carry that sort of uh, uh, deep, significant uh, cultural, uh, uh, spiritual knowledge. And and I agree with you in terms of the the framing of the word spiritual. I, I, it's something that I've struggled with in terms of using it in um, in discussions, especially outside of uh, an indigenous environment. Um, that, and, and thank you for, for uh, um, pointing out that in our worldviews, the, the, you know, the spiritual is part of reality. It's not something that is just like separable, that's contingent on um, our uh, suspension of, uh, uh, of disbelief. Um, but uh, with respect to the fires, I think what, what's interesting in that they're uh, called fires for that very reason, that they are linear, um, rather than, so my use of the word era or, uh, you know, historical period is, is uh, um, a mistranslation in that, in that sense. Um, but, uh, and, and so in, in that framework of, of the fires themselves, we have that, um, ability of both ever presence and still um, transition. Because you can, the healing the wound is not to 
eradicate or forget the wound, yeah. right? Healing the wound is going back and making the wound better, but never forgetting that it's there and its consequences are also here. But you can alter the consequences. So the agency comes in altering the consequences rather than um, bringing back wholeness, which which would be something else. Absolutely. And this particular wound that we're talking about, the, the effects of colonialism, it, it's fundamentally about relationship as well. So revisiting that, uh, uh, I mean, not, not forgetting the wound, but as part of that, it necessitates uh, interracial, cross-cultural dialogue um, and revisioning that space. And in order to really maintain um, our goal of that, that relationship with brotherhood and sisterhood, um, it means never forgetting. Yeah, that makes me think of Elizabeth Pavanelli's book, Is It Empire of Love? that I find so troubling and difficult to deal with, where she talks about a shared womb that unites the Aboriginal community that she works with in the north of Australia. Um, that um, it's like a flesh-eating disease that comes and goes that everyone in the community has, and she has because she lives with them. Uh, but when she travels to Chicago, of course, the doctor's horrified and wants to institute quarantine and all kinds of things. But it's a, it, it's a wound that um, is attached to that particular place, but that images a different notion of bodily integrity and a different notion of, you know, your body is not separate from the community and it's united through this wound moving back and forth from person to person and coming and going. But it's extremely upsetting you know, to a North American uh, c conception. So there's a notion there that the wound is not something you want to get rid of because the wound, you know, it's not the wounds of colonialism in this case, so it's a different wound. But it, it, I think it shows us how all these categories are so place specific, you know, so time and space specific because we can't just assume that healing the wound means the same thing in every context. and. I, I think it's, I come back always to that, um, that quotation we had yesterday about how, how concepts, ideas travel from one place to another and then get refunctioned and that's Jamil's point about so-called nudity that, that you know, it's not nudity in its original context and it's re-perceived as nudity in another context so it shows us that there are limits to, um, to our attempt to just say anything goes that there are, in fact, different modes of interpreting uh, what we think we know, and we have to be very, very aware before we make judgments. Yeah. Well, I I'm glad you brought up um, Parvinelli, Diana, because as I was hearing Jamili talk about her paper, I was also talking about her work with from uh, uh, her, uh, one of her other books, Cunning of Recognition, which has a really interesting intersection with what Jamili is doing. And the same with this wound, like this moment where, you know, uh, the wound signifies something in like, the distribution of, of life and death in a specific place. But when she moved, you know, she is being read to the medical constitution in Chicago and then Montreal, then it just becomes this other thing, you know? But, it, 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 but similarly, in her other book, which is about liberal multi, uh, it's called The Cunning of Recognition. It's about li liberal multiculturalism in the settler context of Australia. Um, you know, she, she deals a lot, again, with ideas of incommensurability or radical alterities, but importantly, what she argues is like, you know, how she, she analyzes these moments in like liberal multiculturalism in settler context when um, differences or alterities reach this stage, we reach this stage when they're being produced as too repugnant to be possibly recognized, you know? And like this moment where like the decisions are made about what is the pornographic, which is obviously ethically associated with something wrong and bad and unacceptable, as opposed to nudity or clothing. Like this, so like who, who, who makes this decision? In which context is this specific kind of nudity then being produced as pornographic for like ideological reason that then have specific uh, consequences, like within like liberal multicultural discourses? You know, how is your difference or your forms of alterities? even possible, it can possibly be articulated in a context where like the only way that it can be read is that as repugnant, as pornographic. And so, you know. so I think that would be 
work that even though she speaks of a very different context from you, which is Aboriginal groups in Northern Australia, there are really interesting intersection with what you're doing, I think. Get the reference with you. Okay. Um, are you saying something? Well, there are uh, quite a few things that I could say. Um, I like the way that the film uh, Jessica brought contrasts with the, the two that I, I presented to you because I, I, I just showed films that were made in villages. You showed uh, a film that uh, takes place in a, an urban environment and it makes me think about how the idea of cultural loss and acculturation is still very strong in Brazil uh, when it comes to indigenous peoples and maybe that's the reason why we still don't have, uh, not that I'm aware of, uh, films that, indigenous focused films that take place in urban environments here. And so maybe this would be an interesting contrast for us to discuss afterwards. Yeah, I have yeah. And I, one of the interesting things about Sean's presentation yesterday was he used the word ontology to talk about the Anishinaabe. And this is, uh, has become more frequent in Brazilian Amerindian studies to, to use the word ontology and not worldview, because then you, if you use worldview, then you use, you're sort of detached from the world itself. Uh, so Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, this Brazilian uh, ethnologist, has been preferring to use this word ontology too, and we can also discuss that uh, later this preference for ontology rather than worldview or even culture. I actually, sort of building on that, one of the things that I, that I thought was really great about or the connection that I draw between between both of your, your work uh, as well is, you know, you talk about uh, different real worlds, which I think is a really powerful way for um, reframing the, uh, the, the discussion over, um, uh, you know, reasserting our place for indigenous ontology and indigenous epistemology, um, but also in, in, the, in the work that, you, that you're doing and in, in looking at, um, you know, so much of it is about making visible to, um, to those who are not part of those other real world what that alternate real world is for, for that experience of the civic space, that experience of, um, you know, these, uh, urban environments that are, you know, usually conceived of as, as being, um, you know, a completely unindigenous space where indigenous people are often very actively erased. Yeah, I have Daniel on my list, and then I think we'll have to go to our our break. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll read what, what I'd like to say in order to be more organized and faster, right? So. Uh, my point here is visual literacy. Uh, we have seen, if I got it right, film production made by indigenous people. Isn't it, Jamil and Jessica, the, the film production was made by indigenous people? Mm -hmm. in both the film, no. The, we have, the film in, my, in my case, there is one film which was a collaborative production. And, uh, Hyper, Women. Hyper Women. There is one indigenous filmmaker and there is two non-indigenous. Right, so, yes, I can say, I write at least partly. So, if that, that's so, uh, what can, can we say about the fact that they have had to make their statements within the framework of modern Western technology and grammar of visuals? Perspective, for example. Uh, the way the girl looked at us in repercussion, right? Uh, or the way we looked at the girls in hyperwomen. I wonder if that constraint does not shape what we are saying. In a way, I see a correspondence between what they are doing and what we are doing here today in this room. Um, we have to say what we want to say within the framework of the English language. 
if we consider that form goes along with content to make meaning, how can we work in alternative ways to allow room for the other to make statements about themselves in their own terms? It is all about the naturalization of many making processes in which we look at the other in our own terms. I think it's uh, thought-provoking in terms of visual literacy because, um, well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's thought-provoking. I, I got thinking about that. Right. I think Jessica would like to just respond quickly. Oh, yeah. well, I was just going to say that I think that it is on, like in terms of Terrell, like Terrell Calder's film, I think that it is on her own terms. And I think that to say that audiovisual mediality is not indigenous is to presume a sort of indigenous authenticity, you know, discourse that, you know, comes out of a colonial framing. So I think that it, it is self-determined. And that in, like, audiovisual technicity is indigenous, you know? Yes, yeah. I, I, I was thinking, like, for example, in terms of perspective. Perspective mm -hmm. is, a, is a construct mm -hmm. that has come to us after medieval times, right? So the oh, way yeah, we I look at it... I wouldn't to say that myself. No. <laughs> yes, that's what I'd like to hear. I don't know if right. The, because the, the indigenous cultures in Brazil are called perspectivist, mm -hmm. and they have nothing to do with the kind of perspective you're talking about. So mm -hmm. they're different concepts of perspective. Mm -hmm. Can I just add something to that, Diana, quickly? Yes, please. I, mean, I think uh, this, it's really important this question. Because uh, 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 I think you're making a, a distinction between content and form, and you're looking for something real and speak in their own terms. I'm, I'm not sure what this means, because if, if we had to believe in an essence and speaking on our, our own terms, we would never understand each other, and we wouldn't even be here, right? Uh, so I think we have to... There has to be some sharing. Yeah, and conflict. Uh, because the conflict is always there. There will always be something which will not be understood. There will be, always be the excess of, of language and understanding. Language doesn't, uh, doesn't succeed in framing everything. There's always something which is not framed and which, which permits the con continuity of language and dialogue. And uh, what Neil raised about uh, civic spaces and, and buildings, I, I can see a, a similarity. And uh, uh, Danielle made me think about this because it's a question of translation because I, I think uh, in terms of civic space in, uh, in an urban environment, uh, this, this idea of civic space is represented by buildings, government buildings, public buildings, and in a rural environment is represented by ritual. Right? And the, the imposition of, uh, let's say, the central station of Toronto is there also in the imposition of that ritual of the hyper-women where, you know, and the, the aggression they're, they're, they're bearing on, on masculinity and men. I mean, that, they're being, that ritual, the ritual can, or the ceremony can be as imposing as a, a concrete material building. I don't know if something crossed my mind. Hey, Ian would like to jump in here, quickly. Just briefly. Um, there is a thought of eventually um, developing a, um, an indigenous film exchange between Brazil and Canada. And um, I think that for me, the, uh, the two presentations today um, were wonderful. And especially, real. Now, I wouldn't feel this way if there hadn't been the visual. And I wouldn't feel this way if the linear uh, linguistic content had gone on for much longer than it did. So the balance between something that um, refers back to what the Mario said the need for um, changing our means of perception from rationality to sensation goes along with what I see as our receptivity according to the two hemispheres of our brain. We receive visual material if we're right-handed through our right hemisphere. Our right hemisphere recognizes the new, recognizes the three-dimensionality, recognizes time, and is the 
location of metaphor and the higher orders of language, but far beyond syntax and far beyond the mechanistic aspect of language. So the balance between linearity, analysis, left brain talk, which can kill right brain reception, has to be balanced in the um, film um, exchange that we do. We can't kill the delight and the power of these images by speaking about them. Because speaking about them, especially in the way that we're driven to speak about them, is completely an epistemic, um, it's epistemicide. Okay. Well, I would say we're back to those, those infernal oppositions. I think it's wrong to speak of a separation of body and mind, I think, to yeah. begin with. And yet, Lim was forced to use that language, those categories, because that's what we have, and those are so strong, and those are so dominant. It's very difficult for us to get beyond them. And I think that's part of what Daniel was saying, that these categories we're working with, including the category of visual literacy, which is a very technical, technicist, um, pedagogical kind of, of language, the way it's being used in many places, uh, is being challenged by the, the films that um, Jessica and Jamie talked about. They are saying you need to extend, expand your understanding of what visual literacy means. Um, but not everyone watching those films will necessarily understand the challenge because there will be a strong pull back to see it as pornography, to see it as National Geographic, you know, to see it in different kinds of um, Context and so the challenge I think is all I think that is the challenge that we're working with and working across different languages helps us helps us because there are different languages that that, uh, that pose these categories differently. So there will always be a perspective. That's what I was saying to you. There will, there will always be a perspective. 